Regular meeting of the Common Council, City of Oneonta. This is March 7th, 2023. It's just about seven o'clock. Hold the meeting to order. Mayor Janet. Here. Second Member Murphy. Council Member Davies. Here. Council Member Rispover. Here. Council Member Lavarishin. Here. Council Member Council Member Harrington. Here. Council Member Rafter. Here. Council Member Falcon. Here. But I guess you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. And thank you folks for joining us here today. Matt and Sean and President Reesberg, but Darren. Yeah. Just it's very good to see you. Oh. My friends, my community are unbelievably committed and talented city staff. Betsy, where are you? On behalf of the city of Oneonta, I thank you for a year of accomplishment. You are the best people to be working with in this moment, this marker in Oneonta's history. As you look at the timeline of this city, I don't think there can be any doubt that we are in a pivotal, a pivotal juncture. This is a light switch moment. We're poised to add job and job creators. We're in the next stages of a marketing effort that will bring in new residents and add to our population. This is our desperate need and the linchpin on which so much turns. There are many hurdles, many challenges to overcome, but we are the present generation and inheritors of this city's history of exceptionalism. And I know that we can and will triumph together because of our success, new residents will fill and staff our businesses. They'll add to the art and entertainment and to the energy of Main Street and they'll add to our tax base. They'll complement and expand the ranks of professional services and supply a next generation to agencies and institutions that are at risk for lack of viable succession plans. This is the goal of my time in office, to add 1,000 new residents to the population, to buck the trend of the region and the state and be a beacon to those who want a good life for themselves and their families, a place that exemplifies the very definition of a welcoming community, and we are that. What I knew when I ran for this office is what we have seen evidenced in this past year, that this city may be small, and our ambition is great, but our willingness to work together is our superpower. It's the power of our community. The prime objective of my first year has been to foster that sense of community, to create opportunities for collaboration, to enlist many voices, and offer opportunity to anyone with a desire to help, anyone willing to engage in respectful dialogue and creative problem solving. And I am so proud to tell you that my call to action has brought over 150 of our neighbors to the table to discuss ideas and create proposals to spur the debate and the action of city boards and commissions and committees and the Common Council. I'm confident that their continuing volunteer efforts will provide the energy and capacity to change the fortunes of our city and more quickly than might be accomplished otherwise. It's what is needed in this moment. We're standing at the door. It's open a crack, but we have to push our way through. We have to, and I know that we will. As a community, this past year has seen the city operating with impressive results, 
from West Street repaving that came in on schedule and on budget to the installation and expansion of an entire electrical system in Niwa Park. To a water and sewer upgrade that included the phase one completion of the waste water treatment plant upgrade. To the installation of a smart city lighting project that will enhance safety and security and provide the ambiance of a soundtrack for shopping and strolling and otherwise enjoying our downtown. Now, having spent these 14 months watching, I have been struck by the staff's commitment and their passion for the city and its future. And everyone should know and take pride in the quality of your city government and in that of its city administrator. I'm happy to report that the failed experiments of the last decade are done. In 2023, the city administrator and the mayor work in sync. And I cannot imagine a more effective form of government. I feel very lucky to have the partnership with Greg Matisse. He's a team builder, and he has led the team by example, and no one works harder. And that goes a long way with me. Those who know me know that it's all about team. It means everything. To be successful, to compete, and win the day. It's my overarching goal to change the trajectory of the city and the level of involvement that everyone in the community has in making this a great place to live. To everyone who has put their faith in me and backed that vision, thank you. I will not let you down. To those who require more evidence of the needs and the plans to address them, I want to take advantage of this forum to share the view the opportunities and the challenges from my vantage point. My goal, our goal, is the recruitment of 1,000 new neighbors. Looking at this as our challenge, in this moment, our field of play, that there are four quarters in the game, and, and we have to play and win all four quarters at the same time, right? One is capturing the interest of thousands of former Oneontans in hopes of converting a portion of them to the notion of relocation. Another is creating the housing needed to accommodate those numbers. <laughs> a third is maintaining and expanding the quality of place, the quality of life in Oneonta. This is our most marketable asset, but it's at risk as well. And lastly, we need to create a vibrant, vital, entertaining downtown that is an attraction for visitors and locals and to those that we are targeting. And again, this all needs to be done at the same time. That is why it's so important that we expand our capabilities through sheer strength of numbers. Neighbors working together. I feel confident in our market. We've combined the expertise and connections of a committee that includes the marketing and promotion leadership of Hartwick and SUNY Oneonta and Springbrook and Bassett and Asigo Now. And we're creating a targeted and unique campaign to attract the alumni of Hartwick and SUNY and Oneonta High School with three existing branding. I don't have to make this stuff up. There it is. That makes an emotional connection to the happy memories of younger years. And with the help of six students, a couple of them right here, <laughs> Hartwick and SUNY students working together, we are building a website tentatively titled O Town Bowling. I happen to hear a phone ring there, uh, that will creatively showcase our assets and entice further connection and follow up from our targeted audience. We're creating digital and print promo, and we're launching a podcast. The Hill City Gambit. Shout out to the Gambit gang over in the corner there. A podcast. I think local folks will like it, but with promotion and a QR code in our materials, it will be an additional hook. One more reason to pay attention to Oneonta if you're not. Now, the first of the podcast will drop in late April. 
They're going to be a lot of fun, but they will also convey some tension. And hopefully gain some audience because of that with the question, will Oneonta be successful in its recruitment? Tune in. I feel confident, but I'm not saying it doesn't keep me awake at night. If it does. For these new residents, it's going to be a better experience than it's been for newcomers in quite a while. Through this effort, we expect that they will form a bond like that of the railroad workers 100 years ago. But the thread that will bind them won't be that they're working for the DNH. It will be their status as returning newcomers. That bond that will keep them here will be the shared sense of belonging to a neighborhood. That this will happen, I have no doubt. And shout out to Kathy Barati, a recent new arrival to Oneonta and the chairperson of our welcome wagon committee. This committee continues to grow and grow and grow. It's made up of similar minds, connective souls who will embrace new arrivals and nurture their assimilation with social gatherings and other creative incentives. They're staging a reception for new residents and their families in mid-April, and I am really looking forward to it. I hope this is the first of May. Another very important function of the Welcome Wagon Committee, by the way, will be the collection of data. That's huge. Knowing our numbers and monitoring and adjusting for the analytics will be our best assurance of a successful marketing campaign. As I said, the conversion of interested new arrivals into residents will require several other concurrent successes. Everything needs to go right at the same time. This is the 30,000 foot view, and it's a little scary. Everything must fall in place at the same time. Housing. There's nothing more important. If there aren't affordable housing options, both our recruitment and retention efforts will fail. This is that moment, though, the winds, as they say, are favorable. There are demographic shifts underway. And in this moment, they present a silver lining to an otherwise dark cloud. This is a fact. The future will be increasingly less financially attractive for investors in student housing. Not everyone's aware of that fact, though. So that's a message that we must delicately but persuasively impart to our current landlords, as well as those who continue to look at the Oneonta housing market as an investment opportunity. And we need to make sure that baseball rentals don't simply replace the housing, the student housing in the city. Fighting that will be one of my least popular crusades but I will fight. The center city must be allowed the opportunity to share the same connection of neighborhood as the sixth ward. God bless the sixth ward, but it shouldn't be the only neighborhood in the city. And to repeat, we need the housing. I took my wife, Betsy, to dinner for her birthday recently, and someone we both knew came up to our table on the way out the door. Says, Everyone loves Oneonta. <laughs> Oneonta's a great place to live. We're doing great things. I love Oneonta. Everyone should move here. And so <laughs> after a bit, you know, he left. We said goodbye. Great to see him. And then from behind me comes this little voice. This woman says, she says, oh, so you're the mayor? <laughs> <laughs> so she's a new arrival and got a job at the college. And she had to search for six months to find a home locally, but we're working on it. We're working with developers and courting others, and we will find creative opportunities to enhance the city's density. Our housing commission is actively strategizing ways to improve our neighborhoods, find and promote developable parcels, maximize use of upper floors, determine options for senior housing, and support for those aging in place, identify refugee housing, and pave the way for more affordable housing, market rate housing, and long-term rentals, and smart growth. Each of these unique topics are the charges of the Housing Commission work groups, each made of community volunteers in serious discussion of solutions. 
Now, I've attended many of these meetings, and I have great confidence in the likelihood of actionable proposals being created, proposals for council action. We're going to get there. We're on track. So we have strategies in place, marketing and housing. What else will those considering relocation be looking for? What would you be looking for? Quality of place, quality of life. A green, walkable, pedestrian-friendly city with blocks of restaurants and retail stores on Main Street. And in my vision, a destination for entertainment and engagement on Market Street, an entertainment district, where the Foothills Performing Arts Center serves as an anchor to blocks-long collection of social opportunities for every age, where a permanent home for the farmer's market and a showcase for artisanal foods and culinary arts that is locals, visitors, and would be new residents. Where a beautiful and functional new transit hub provides easy access to OPT buses, as well as rentable electric vehicles and scooters and bikes. And where the foundation supplied by a new two-tier garage provides the base for five dozen new apartments right on Main Street, right on Market Street, rather, in the middle of the action. Housing, social engagement options, a walkable city to include pedestrian and bicycle-friendly roundabout at the entrance of Lettuce Highway, offering an entry to the city that's appropriate and what you'd expect of a vital and growing municipality. And Lettuce and Les Foster Highways will be transformed with sidewalks, and bicycle paths and trees and landscaping. And this, by the way, this is an example of what can be done when the city and town work together for our mutual benefit. One example and many more to come. And when you leave Lettuce Highway, exit the roundabout and you find yourself on Main Street, you'll have the option of pulling into any number of now available and cheap short-term parking spots. With longer-term parking identified through clearly marked signage, and potentially an online real-time guide to maximum convenience for finding a spot. You'll be losing more than a bit of parking when the garage is demolished and then built anew. So we will need to be creative in identifying and using every single spot. Personally, I'd like to see a trolley. Yes, I would. I'd like to see a trolley that takes a regular route to downtown and center city and then loops into Damaski Field and Miwa Park. We have a parking solutions task force that'll work on all of that and see what happens. It's made up of community volunteers. This task force is business owners, landlords, community members, planners, and city staff. And it's not a fun assignment to take on. Not a popular issue, but they've stepped up. So a big thank you to everyone involved. Hard choices, difficult problems, but it's our responsibility to those who will follow that we put in the work now so that our future is not compromised by any dereliction of duty. As so many of you are aware and bring to my attention regularly, there's another concern of consequence and it needs to be remedied. Just as do so many cities, we have a growing population of untethered, unsheltered, sometimes mentally ill, or drug-dependent souls. You'll see them wandering Main Street, Chestnut Street, and the South Side. Ensuring their wellness is our responsibility as a caring community. And I was proud to play whatever small role I did in the Department of Housing and Urban Development's awareness of only on this homeless issue. They watch my videos. Kind of cool. But it was the strength of the application and the case made by opportunities for Otsego and its local partners and the daily challenges of assisting our at-risk population that won the day. And a grant for three quarters of a million dollars to provide support services and shelter to those so desperately in need. Now, caring for our least able is a moral imperative, but the acceptance of help cannot be forced upon anyone. Even those most at risk have the right to refuse help. So working with Chief Witzenberg on the creation of an educational campaign for our downtown and the community 
so that they could be well informed of the appropriate actions or phone calls to make when they see a need to intercede. A citizen's academy. I'm going to take just a quick minute here to acknowledge Chief Wittenberg, who I guess is dealing with some illness in the house, going around and around. He's got little kids. Chief Wittenberg, it has been my pleasure to get to know him, and my respect for him knows no bounds. He's inventive, informed, empathetic, and caring. Are you listening, Chief? He's a real leader. And the regard and the esteem in which he's held by every leader of every agency that has worked with him should be noted and celebrated. He created the Community Solutions Fund, the original ad hoc committee, pulling together state, town, college, and city law enforcement, social, medical, emergency services, and others who provide a lifeline to those desperate for help. And a shout out and recognition of Mark Davis, and the Community Wellness Committee, who are doing such important work to address the concerns of our youngest citizens and their families. Childcare, food insecurity, they've identified gaps and are working on ways to fill them. Now, current topic and proposal in the works, and one that I absolutely heartily endorse, is the formation of a public-private partnership and creation of a community center, offering one-stop access to resources, and community programs, social opportunities, and a whole lot more. Will Rivera advanced that idea at a youth-themed summit of the committee just a few weeks ago. And that proposal is the very definition of community wellness. While we work to identify ways in which we can provide greater levels of service to everyone in need and enhance our affordable housing options, we do have to make our city safer and more engaging and more vital especially to those who might otherwise be reluctant to visit, let alone move here. There is an initiative underway to exponentially increase the attractiveness of downtown visitors. Help them, actually. We put together a committee that will be identifying strategies and creating campaigns to substantially increase foot traffic. Engagement marketing. Thank you, Katie Lepari Shu, for leading that. And thank you, too, to Emily Falco and Len Carson and Ed May for bringing to life a very cool new congregate space, the alleys of peace with festive lighting and murals and God only knows what else. <laughs> another committee and another initiative is focused on Muller Plaza. We have a group coming together with representation from Oneonta High School, the colleges, and the art and performance organizations in the community that will be identifying vetting and scheduling use of Muller Plaza by artists and performers and vendors and others with hopes that any day, any week, at any time, a visitor to our downtown will find an entertaining reason to spend time on Main Street. Think Ithaca Commons. And actually on the subject of Muller Plaza, we have another task force, another task force, that's looking at the construction of not one, but two performance Stages one in Muller Plaza, large enough to accommodate half a dozen performers, and dedicated to the legendary Al Galadoro. Yeah, Al heard that. And another significantly larger performance stage that honors Oneonta's own Jerry Jeff Walker, which will be nestled in Biwa Park. These will spring to life through a combination of ARPA funding and the con contributions of, to no one's surprise. The future for Oneonta Foundation. So, Al Feynman, I presume you're listening. Thank you, as always, to one of the city's great benefactors, Al Feynman. As the visitor continues their stroll down Main Street, they will be certain of one thing Oneonta is a college town. The flags of Hartwick and SUNY will be fluttering, and both will have downtown footprints. SUNY, with an engaging ground floor presence on the corner of D Street, and Hartwick up just a block or so in the Grain and Beverage Innovation Center in the Deep Street Lofts. The lofts, by the way, will open their doors in the next couple of months, paving the way for addition of dozens upon dozens of new residents who will view downtown as their backyard. That's just a taste of the energy that you'll be seeing with the opening of the Ford on Main, Springbrook's reimagining of the Ford block, the new vitality of Main Street will be palpable. 
And as you continue down Main Street, you could well find yourself in a crowd coming from or going to the Oneana Theater. We've been waiting a long time, but because folks never lost faith, never gave up, it'll only be a couple of years and we'll be going to shows in one of the great vaudeville theaters still standing. The entertainment and, you know, the entertainment offerings in Oneonta are rich and diverse with music, plays, and performances being offered on the campuses and in the community. It's one of my goals to increase the public's awareness and support of these performances. I know this, the college campuses would welcome more community attendance at their events. And certainly the foothills and our downtown venues would benefit from increasing support of the college faculty, admin, staff, and students. So we're working on that. To attract new residents and visitors, to make Oneonta an even better place to live for the 13,000 or so that live here now, we'll need to give a major boost to our economy, creating jobs and opportunities. And here again is where the colleges have stepped up to take the leadership role. SUNY Oneonta has spearheaded the creation organization and propulsion of the Regional Innovation Council. That's put the leadership of businesses and agencies and institutions of the region in the same room with a focus on action planning. And I am so proud to be a part of that. There's no doubt in my mind that this is going to be a game changer for our economy. Entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, this is a heads up. And keep your eyes on the railroads, railroad yards and cross your fingers. We got some big things, hoping for some big things there. <laughs> Jobs are on the way. Affordable housing is on the way. A vibrant Main Street and Chestnut Street and, and River Street and an entertaining Market Street, they're on the way. New residents, new neighbors, they're coming too. Because of the efforts of all of you and so many others who are not here tonight. And when our new residents arrive, they will find a city that is operating at peak efficiency, underfunded and understaffed as we may be. As you know, we need to borrow substantially from our reserves last year. That was just to keep the city going. No frills, no new needed equipment, same bare bones staffing. Judy would agree that is not a practice that's sustainable. So I am and will be working with our community partners to determine the new revenue streams that are going to be necessary to our financial health and viability as a city. And getting back to our city administrator and the invaluable role that he's played this year, this fall he introduced an inclusive and transparent mechanism through which all the city departments were able to clearly communicate their successes and their challenges to the council. Consequently, Spending priorities were more easily identified and the city's thin budget was stretched to its maximum effectiveness. And although higher salaries can be found in other cities and with other employers, the loyalty and the dedication of our city staff in all the departments needs to be acknowledged and celebrated. Like the central garage, <laughs> let's take it for granted, but the city provides Services 24 7, 365 days a year. Our plows, ambulances, and police cars are kept running and in top condition by the crew at the central garage led by Charlie Evans. And despite the national shortage of bus drivers, our public transit team meets their schedule day in and day out, and day hoteling support of his employees and co workers is boundless. And OPT is a model of team efficiency because of it. I've talked about the leadership of Chief Witzenberg, but I want to salute our sworn officers and support staff who display a level-headed professionalism that inspires trust and confidence in the community. And these days, that is a big deal. Code enforcement, not the most popular task in the city, but the community is becoming increasingly understanding of its challenges to a neighborhood's improvement and the need for a strong, and even-handed response to unsafe or poorly maintained structures, trash piles, unshoveled and slippery sidewalks, and a host of other concerns you know when you see them. Stephen Yearly's leadership, knowledge, and fairness are equaled only by, and I can say this because he's not here, is thick skin. I like to celebrate teamwork when I see it, so hats off to DPW. 
one of our most understaffed departments somehow, they get the job done day in and day out. The Department of Public Works takes care of us, assures that our basic needs and expectations as a city, our infrastructure and services are delivered and maintained and even still busy as they are, they still find time to hang snowflakes and build playgrounds for our dogs. So thank you very much. These are the small things that make our little city so livable. A big thank you to Chris Yakabuchi and his team. And on the subject of team, our parks and recreation are the jewels among our many assets. And parks director Lou Lansing is the caring, committed team leader that we are lucky to have. I'm never surprised when mayors from cities three times our size tell me that we are punching above our weight, that tens of millions of dollars in grants and low interest loans flowing to the city are matched only by the energy and creative thinking of our budding planning and development department. Judy Pangman, presume you're watching. We are so fortunate to have you. And Greg was wise. They'll double down on our success with the addition of Stephen Yearly and Sarah Plano to the team. Whether you've joined us here in council chambers or you're watching at home, we've gathered tonight through the organization and the execution of our city clerk's office. In fact, many of us would have no idea, talking about me, what's happened, happening or going to happen in city government without the efforts of Terry Harrington and Bonnie and Val. Safeguarding our vital records and communicating our business, these are the unsung little notice functions that keep our city running. Speaking of which, finance. Everything the city touches, touches the finance department. And it's systems that manage and account for every taxpayer dollar. Ginny Lee's eight day commitment to, I tell you, a week, eight day a week commitment. I did have that, right? Commitment to the job. I'm still wondering about it. And her steadfast leadership has been the epitome of public service and informed a reputation that she has built over decades in City Hall. Thank you, Ginny. Everything the city does also touches the human resources office. We know that our people are our most valuable resource in retaining them and supporting their success and well being. That's the daily goal of a team of knowledgeable, caring, and empathetic professionals that Joe Tenning is leading so well. And on the subject of dedicated professionals, not here, but the city of Oneonta Fire Department. Quick response and dousing fires may be what comes to mind, but it's their top flight emergency medical service that shines a bright light within a struggling regional healthcare system. The department is continuously preparing and training to handle any emergency, which is why they get called from near and far to assist with the most unique and difficult of rescues. Chief Brian Knapp, which call a forward thinker with his leadership and his creative enhancement of his capacity for response, OFD always answers the call. And finally, one last shout out to Mike Stevens at the airport. He cleared the one runway, mowed the grass, filled the tanks and provide all that service with a smile. And that is no small thing. This is a great staff. I cannot tell you how proud I am to work with them. You can all be proud too. Oneonta is on the cusp of great things and you can see the progress. We have the well-functioning government you'd want. And we have the growing engagement of the community in determining our best paths forward. We know our goals. We've identified our challenges. We have the partners and their commitment. We've begun the respectful and inclusive conversations and the strategic planning. We understand the importance of this moment and our duty in this critical hour. Our embrace of the challenge and our success in its address will be a turning point in the history of our city. The state of our city is strong. Our future will be bright. We will flip this light switch because working together, there is nothing that we can't do. Karen has set up some refreshments down in the lobby so you can sign none other than Jenny's even um, if anybody wishes to network or for some reason doesn't want to take the right to do. <laughs> so thank you folks. Enjoy the enjoy the cakes and cookies.
All right, so uh, moving along now with our meeting, we are. Do we have Luke as well? You got a video? Not yet. Well, why don't we roll through and he will, right? Um, so, petitioners, have we any petitioners here? Are you looking at this? Every was left of it, I'm thinking no. Um, and public hearings. None of the uh, if that gets loud, which is all right, yeah, just because we, you know, people eating cookies is very disappointing. All right, um. Then we will move right on to our boards and commission reports. <clears throat> yes, excuse me. Um, I was writing to Luke to find out where he was. He mm -hmm. says he needs a password. Mm -hmm. He just needs to click the link. Mm. Is he signed into Zoom? If he's not signed in, that'll block him. All right, so we're going to continue on with our um, boards and commission reports, and uh, we'll start off with the zoning and housing board of appeals, and that's um, the number that. Well, uh, two uh, items were under consideration: 63 Center Street has to do with parking, and uh, 38 Cedar, uh, which I believe is um, which is about um, um, increasing uh, tenancy. Um, both of these are tabled for table uh, for further information. So that's a extent of the. Uh, okay. I presume we have no questions, but I'll ask anyone. You said 63 Center and 38 Cedar? 63 Center, 38 Cedar. Thank you. Outside of that, any further questions? Thank you very much, John. Appreciate that. And then we're going to move on to Council Member Bakari Shu for a report on the Commission on Community Relations and Human Rights. Okay. Um, community Relations and Human Rights met on February 23rd. Um, we had a guest, actually three guests um, from the Hunger Coalition, the Vice Reverend Cynthia Walton Lovett. Um, they did basically discuss the work that they do um, and kind of advised the women on ways that we can move forward with addressing food insecurity in the community. Um, <clears throat> there were there were a couple topics that were addressed. Uh, one was the warming station. Um, so um, we talked about potential sites for the warming station. Um, basically, it's still available to be held um, in the church next door next year, uh, but it's not ideal because it's kind of small. Um, Reverend Cynthia wanted to be clear about one of the statement that was made that the warming station was being used for primarily food. Um, she said that that's not true. Um, potentially when the board's table was closed that people had gone over there looking for a meal. Um, but now that the board's table is reopened, they're not seeing people who are doing that. And additionally, um, just to consider that people who uh, live their life unsheltered don't necessarily like sleep through the night in the same way um, as those who have a home do. So um, yeah, so it's just interesting to to understand that and use a little bit better. Um, she also noted that one full meal per day um, 
is not a common thing in communities. Uh, it's pretty unique to our community. So she advised us to consider what we would do in the instance when our school was closed and we can't provide that meal um, to people who are depending on it. You know, do we have a contingency plan? Um, schools, um, they're looking to connect with schools um, a little bit more to help address some of that with kids. Um, they partnered with Regional Food Bank and United Way. They discussed, uh, they discussed an organization called COAD, which is Community Organizations Active in Disasters. They gave us a contact for that and suggested that the city consider having a representative on that board. Um, yeah, they also discussed the urgency with the SNAP benefits changing. Um, there was a COVID benefit that um, allowed for $281 um, per family per month. That is going down, or it's already gone down to $23 a month. So that was pretty startling. Um, I also read the excerpt from the letter that we received from the coordinator of the Lord's Table with regards to the cost of feeding and housing um, folks who need it in our county. Um, and I don't have it handy, but it, really the kind of, again, sort of staggering back from that was that it costs almost a million dollars a year um, to house uh, unsheltered people in hotels. Um, and that's generally borne by um, BSS, that cost. Um, they made some recommendations that I, um, or notes, thought starters that things that the community wellness committee may be wanting to think about. Um, I wasn't able to make that meeting, so I wasn't able to bring them up, um, but I do have some, some notes for that. Um, additionally, Franklin, oh, I'm sorry. And so that was kind of it for the Hunger Coalition. And then we discussed the Trailblazer Award date. Um, we're expecting that to be at the end of March to keep it during Women's History Month. And also um, Dr. Franklin Chambers had held a seat on the commission, but he has moved. And so his seat will need to be filled. Um, the chair mentioned that there are some people who are kind of in line to be on the commission, which is great. So that's it. Thank you very much. Sure. Moving along now to our um, Board of Public Service report and Councilman Harrington. Uh, thank you, Mayor. We met on March 2nd, um, 4 p.m. Um, some of the new business was 178, 188 Chestnut Street. Um, that's the old blue, like, appliance center there on the right as you're going down through by Nick's. Uh, they declared that it'd be an unsafe building. The building's kind of falling in on itself. Um, uh, it's in the process of possibly being sold. So they, uh, ordered it to be demolished within 60 days. Um, <clears throat> and they're going to work with the owner and the owner's attorney with that. Uh, 18 Grand Street was uh, a little more of a topic because uh, Steve brought this forward that they have a person living in the bottom that kind of barricaded themselves into the to the building. Um, so they need to get access in there so they could get try to get the person out. There's a bunch of code violations with the way they run the electric uh, on the outside of the building and stuff like that. And it's just a real danger to just not the people that are in there and the 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 owner of the building is actually asking for help. So that's, you know, they're on board with anything and hopefully everything that can be done to do that. Uh, 10 Ford Ave, um, that was a little bit more of a, of a discussion on uh, demolition uh, permit. Um, they demolished the building. Uh, the person came forward um, and just in the paperwork, they forgot to file the demolition permit to, to get it. Um, so the committee was kind of going back and forth. There's like two different ways of doing it. You can either come to this this board or you can go to the planning board to try to demolish your garage or something like that. Um, so this board tabled it uh, for a little bit more review, and then we're going to come back on the next meeting to finalize what the uh, process they want to do. And then an old business at 29 Church Street, um, it was a housing inspection. There was a couple of fees that people didn't realize were out there. So they're going to, they gave the, the person a, an opportunity. They opened it up so that he could voice his, his concerns and stuff and try to help work with them and stuff. 
That's about it. Okay. Any comments on this? Oh, well, thank you. Thanks for the question. Yeah. 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 Um, 18 Grand Street, they say how many people are in that basement? Two, I believe. I don't, I'm not 100% sure. I thought it was two. I'm not, I'm not sure if they know. It's like a squatter that got in there and any kids involved? Not that they said. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Scott. And we'll move on back to um, your report on shoot or report on Parks and Rec. Okay. Parks met yesterday, uh, March 6th at 7 o'clock. Um, we discussed a couple of things. Um, so you all may remember that we approved a marker for America 250 that was proposed by the local DAR chapter. Um, they're going to place that marker uh, this spring and with in combination with DPW, um, and they're going to hold a ceremony um, for that on June 15th at 11 a.m. It's a Thursday, um, and that will be on that's Memorial Walkway near where the marker is placed. Um, we talked a little bit about History Day, which is something that's been brought up by Councilmember Murphy previously. Someone representing uh, History Day, which will be held at Sunni Yanta this year, um, reached out to the Parks Administrator <clears throat> to inquire about parking in Neowa Park um, for that, <clears throat> excuse me, for that event. And um, Lou followed up with them with some questions about you know, logistical things and, and just hasn't heard back. Um, but that's something I know that we're going to be really accommodating um, for that event. And so I'm just kind of encouraging, you know, that that connection because if it's like, you know, if they need the accommodation and we can provide it, that would be great. Okay. AAA, our local AAA branch is doing walkway cleanup on um, Best Memorial Walkway uh, around Earth Bay, which is April 22nd this year. Uh, we discussed trash. So, oh, actually, I have a question about this. But um, so, trash is an issue in the park. A lot of the cans <clears throat> are the open ones that just have the bags in them and trash blows. Um, additionally, there's a lot of like littering. So, DPW does you know, clean up the parks quite frequently. Um, but uh, apparently when the garbage cans on Main Street are replaced, the existing garbage cans from Main Street will be added to the park. So there will be more cans down there, which we're hoping will curb some of the littering. Um, there's no real solution to replacing the open bins, but it's something that, you know, we're aware of. Um, the outlaw season this year will run from June 2nd to July 29th. Uh, we discussed the tennis tennis courts in Wilbur Park. They are going to be used heavily in the spring by OHS starting March 27th. Um, oh, and Hartwick, excuse me, OHS and Hartwick. So OHS will be 2.30 to 5 on all courts Monday through Friday, and Hartwick will be 5 to 7. So from 2.30 to 7, um, there will be, there will be teams playing. Uh, from five to seven, Hartwick, Hartwick is only going to use five of the seven courts, though, so there will be two open courts for community use. Um, and then Saturday, they both also have practice, but all the courts will be open by 1 to 1.30 for community use. And the Nets will go up approximately March 20th, and there, just a reminder, there's no rest, there are no restrooms in the park until after the last frost. Uh, summer concert series is set, bands are booked, states are set. Um, if the weather is bad, they're held in the pavilions. Um, I had a couple of thoughts about that, um, potentially about like, you know, in this, um, discovery of what, what we're going to do for a performance stage, maybe investing in like a tent like structure, like soup room has for like 4th of July might be a good idea. So we have, we can use the stage that we're building specifically for this and still be able to hold it in inclement weather. Um, okay, we discussed the parks, new parks user fees. Um, there's been a little bit of pushback for that. Um, basically, it's going to cost the parks department $7,000 for the season, approximately $7,000 to rent restrooms um, from June to October. 
if all of it's spread across users and it's based on it's spread across all the users, it's based on how big their event is. But if all of the users don't return, then the city will have to bear that cost. And we don't really have a plan for that. Either. Um, and that's it, I think, that we talked about. That's all I have notes on. Actually, oh, sorry. Um, the market placement on June 15th, mm -hmm. well, who is going to be presenting? Um, the DAR, and it's the same combination with the best pub. Yep. Um, can I actually ask a question that's related to my notes? So um, Lou had mentioned the garbage cans on Main Street being replaced, and I had actually been meaning to ask about the status of the new garbage cans, the big belly cans that are supposed to be on Main Street. That order. Uh, Chris, do you know what the time on those? I want to say it was six to eight weeks. Maybe we did summer. Is it that far out? Maybe, yeah. Don't focus on that. I think that we're over here. I'm eager for them. That's great. Did I miss anything? Yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much again. Thank you. And we'll move on now to our committee reports, uh, beginning with the Quality Life and Infrastructure Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we met on February 27th. Um, and as usual, we had quite the agenda. Um, we discussed briefly the honorary street naming. Um, I developed a draft legislation that we could start with looking at um, it was a combination of what a few other cities have done and uh, we'll be discussing that at the next meeting um uh we discussed the wilbur park master plan um at length and um, we thought that was something we were going to be having a discussion tonight about but there's some more work needs to be done so it's gone back um they have the work done hopefully we'll see that again um soon at the committee and then we can push it forward to the council again uh, park service fees, um, as uh, Councilman um, Lapari Shu said, uh, that was something that we also discussed at our committee, and uh, that was based on some um, uh, some issues that came up with some of the the events organizers um, that uh, would be paying these fees. But it, it really circulates around um, needing. Uh, portable toilets and appropriate number of portable toilets in the in the park for the summer. And I think um, what the way I look at it after thinking more about it, I think that if we have proper facilities, that's going to bring more people to the area for the events. And I think there will be um, a, a positive payoff for that. So um, there were some questions that came out of it though mm -hmm. um, about potentially offsetting some of the costs. We don't know if this could be done or not, but um, there was a question about that using the community initiative, initiative grant toward that, um, but we would have to go through Judy and Jenny to see if they would be able to answer that for us. So um, if you could think about it, get back to it. If you have any questions you want to ask me, um, just send me an email. Um, your management task force, um, we discussed that, and I actually, uh, actually, the city clerk sent the um, recommendations from the task force to NIMR to get their opinion, which they did get back to us. And I'll be bringing that to, I'll send that response out to everybody before our next meeting. Um, I actually was hoping that our city attorney could attend this committee meeting. And uh, there were two items that we didn't get to that we'll, we'll discuss it next time. Um, 5K race courses and West End Avenue parking. That's it. Question. And we'll move back for a third time to Council Member Lafari Shu and report on the Finance and Human Resources Committee. Yeah, so actually, I would have been able to attend that committee meeting. So I was hoping that when he was there, he might be able to talk about what happened at the meeting. That's you? I guess that's me. I guess it's only fair because she had a cover for me the last time. Uh, so we met on the 27th, um, and the first topic was emergency management specialists, which was brought back um, with qualifications and what's going to be asked of that person to do. Um, it was felt that the 
to adjust the the salary range for that. Um, I believe that is on coming up on this uh, agenda for that. Uh, we finally got somebody that bid on our pavement marking bid award. Finally, um, after a couple of years of not having it, um, the first out the door is going to be a little bit more expensive because we got to get the whole city called up. And then I think it's three years. So the next two years, it steps down because you won't have to do the whole city at a time. But it is very important to get the whole city back up with the lines and the crosswalks and, and stuff like that. And it's it's nice that we finally found somebody. So thank you, Chris. <clears throat> um, fuel bid, uh, we got our bids for propane and diesel. Um, and we were going with what the purchasing and our finance department told us to do. Um, they they got the lowest bids that they could. So um, our ARPA funding on River Street for the uh, water and sewer, uh, they, the um, Greg and his team asked for some more time. So they're coming back to the next meeting for that. So we'll discuss it more. And then our, um, the whole homestead property tax that uh, council member Lapari Shu brought up, we tabled because we only thought it was fair for her to be able to be in attendance to, to discuss it with us. I think that's it. Sure. Uh, all right, well, thank you very much, Scott. Appreciate that. And we'll move on now to Council Member Davies and the Community Wellness Committee. Thanks, Mayor. The Community Wellness Committee met last night, and while we had a short agenda, we had a robust discussion. Um, we debriefed the uh, children slash teen summit meeting that we had a few weeks ago. Um, and then we looked at some of the themes and, and patterns that we saw. Um, and then determine some next steps we'd like to work on. So one thing is to try and utilize um, either the city site or all for Indiana site to have a clearinghouse for partner information as well as resources. That seems to be something that's come up repeatedly both at this last meeting as well as in August at our larger summit. Uh, we're going to try to survey our participants in that meeting and uh, determine what is some of the best next steps in terms of addressing some of the um, issues that most impact children and teens. And then we did, did talk about um, kind of the structure for trying to create action. We, we've had some great meetings, but we need to have the structure be able to facilitate action. So we talked about that. Um, really have no yet conclusion there. I think we're gonna talk about that again. We also begin to think about our upcoming um, meeting in April and we we're planning on having a food insecurity um, group meeting with some of the different folks that are addressing food insecurity and realize that we might like to push that until May and so that we can have our April meeting to um, kind of discuss some of the issues we've just talked about, kind of clear those up as well as plan that May meeting about food insecurity. Um, so we'll be getting that group together in May. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so we also talked about trying to create some subcommittees that might be able to address some of these little sections or little pieces that we're talking about that we're addressing um, and, and hoping we use that to be able to do some more action. So again, further discussions that we have, we're trying to fight off a pretty big issue here and, and attack it. And uh, there's some challenges there as well, but we certainly have had some good discussions. Do we have uh, questions or comments? All right, well, Mark, thank you very much. for Just, for just one if I may, Mayor. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I just I just wanted to say how um, I was able to attend most of the summit that we had, and um, what a pleasure it is just to have so many community members care so much about what they do. And a uh, thank you to my fellow uh, community members, uh, Lapari Shu and Davy, for for um, their contributions to the meeting. It was it was very informative and um, a lot to think about. Thank you very much. Right. And if there's no further comments on um, that report, I'll begin. Thank you, Davies, and we'll move on to the city administrator's report. Great. Thanks, Mayor. It's a brief report tonight on uh, one of the things on the agenda, the water treatment plant bond resolution. Just because we've we've done this a number of times, I just wanted to clarify in case there's any questions as to why we're doing it again. Uh, we've got updated based on the the updated award of bill funding, bipartisan infrastructure law funding. Um, we have to update our bond resolution. While we don't intend to bond for anything on this project, it's all going to be grant or 0% loan. 
we have to have a bond resolution to the total cost of the project, which is eight million um, and change. Um, so that's just the explanation there, unless there's any questions. Our next step on that project, which I think it's out today or tomorrow, is the RFQ, RFQ, RFQ for engineering uh, design of that project. So, twenty-seventh letter. Yeah, getting there. Um, we're going to be kicking off a health insurance task force. It's like an internal thing, um, comprised of myself, HR director, finance director, our labor leaders, uh, possibly an elected official. We can talk about if we're going to have somebody yeah, uh, talk about out there. It's it's in the morning, not correct, nine a.m. Yeah, it's a tough time. It's a tough one for half of our more than half of our townspeople, but we'll talk about that. Okay. And our, our new consultant, health insurance broker, USI, which we um, authorized hiring at our last meeting, I believe, will be leading us through that process. Really, our intent is to just engage everyone that's involved in the city, our employees, our leaders, and have a better understanding of the process of managing our health care expenses and looking at different options eventually as to what might be available. Um, city and town staff are working together on the RFQ. We've, we've Put out the RFQ. We have responses. We're reviewing to hire an engineer to design the Route 2328. That's the Lettuce Highway, Les Foster Highway um, improvements. And then additional street lights, Len, you'll be happy to know um, on Roundhouse Road they were installed today, so those should be working. And there are a number of other 20 or 30 other punch list items on that street light project that are still to be completed, but they're working. That's all I have is we had any questions. Questions for Greg? Yes, Mark. Just a comment on Greg, thanks to you and the department heads for that conversation about healthcare and addressing that. And that's certainly a big concern. So I'm really just see that you guys are trying to drive forward on to figure out if there's other solutions. So thank you. Sure. Yeah, and I know we mentioned before, Mark, about around this initiative, that sort of thing. That's one of the topics of discussion. Yeah. Not just health insurance plans and costs, but other really avenues. Excellent. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. Further comment? Questions. Greg, it's Len. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So, Greg, thank you very much for getting that uh, the lights up, and Chris, thank you for getting the lights up. Uh, I know the tenants appreciate it. So, well done. All right. Um, in terms of the mayor's remarks, I think uh, we're going to call that done and uh, move on to the consent agenda. Um, let him move. Were you were you able to uh, to tune in for those remarks? Those in fact, the city. The majority of it, Mayor. Yes, I, I got on a little bit um, before seven thirty, and um, Carrie uh, kindly sent the text to to me, and I have it up on my screen as well. So I'm I'm reviewing it as well from where I picked off, left okay. off. Okay. All right. We'll move on to the consent agenda. With the approval of the minutes, motion number one that the Common Council approves the minutes of the regular meeting held February 21st, 2023. Motion number two that the Common Council approves the warrants totaling $543,649.88 and the same be placed on the Director of Finance desk for payment as presented. Motion number three that the Common Council approves the ordinance to amend chapters 300-7 and 300-70 of the City of Oneonta Municipal Code as they pertain to the R2 residential district and non-conforming uses. This ordinance was laid on February 28, 2023. Motion number four, that the Common Council approves the following resolution. <clears throat> resolution authorizing the issuance of $8,072,635 to real bonds of the city of Oneonta, Otsego County, New York, with a the cost of water system improvements in and for said city. Whereas all conditions precedent to the financing of the capital project here and after described, including compliance with the provisions of the State Environmental Quality Review Act have been performed now, therefore be it resolved that the affirmative vote of not less than two thirds of the total voting strength of the Common Council of the City of Oneonta, Otsego County, New York, as follows. Section one, water system improvements, including at the water treatment plant, as well as various distribution systems at an estimated maximum cost of $8,072,625 being a specific object or purpose Having a period of probable usefulness of 40 years pursuant to subdivision one of paragraph A of section 11 of the local finance law is 
hereby authorized. Section two, that the plan for the financing of such object or purpose is by the issuance of $8,072,625 in bonds of said city hereby authorized to be issued there or pursuant to the provision of the local finance law, provided, however, that the amount of bonds to be issued shall be reduced to the extent of grants received in connection therewith, there being $5 million grants anticipated. Section three, the faith and credit of said city of Oneonta, Pesico County, New York, are hereby irrevocably pledged to the payment of the principal and the interest on such obligations as the same respectively become due and paid. An annual appropriation shall be made in each year sufficient to pay the principal of and interest on such obligations becoming due and payable in such years. To the extent not paid from other sources, there shall be annually levied on all taxable real property of said city a tax sufficient to pay the principal of and interest on such obligations as the same at the same become due and payable. Section four. The powers and duties of advertising such bonds for sale, conducting the sale, and awarding the bonds are hereby delegated to the director of finance who shall advertise such bonds for sale, conduct the sale, and award the bonds in such manner as the director of finance shall deem best for the interests of the city. Section 5. The power to issue and sell bond anticipation notes, including renewals of such notes, is hereby delegated to the director of finance. Such notes shall be of such terms, forms, and contents as may be prescribed by said director of finance consistent, consistent with the provisions of the local finance law. Section six, all other matters, except as provided herein relating to such bonds, including determining whether to issue such bonds having substantially level of defining debt service and all matters related thereto, prescribing whether manual or facsimile signatures shall appear on said bonds, prescribing the method for the recording of ownership of said bonds, appointing the fiscal agent or agents for said bonds, providing for the printing and delivery of said bonds, and said bonds are to be executed in the name of the city, and the facsimile signature of the director of finance, providing for the manual counter signature of a fiscal agent or of a designated official of the city, the date, denominations, maturities, and interest payment dates, place or places of payment, and also including the consolidation with other issues shall be determined by the director of finance. Section seven, the director of finance is hereby further authorized at her sole discretion to execute project finance and your loan agreement and any other agreements within New York State Environment Facilities Corporation, including amendments thereto and including any instruments or amendments thereto in the effectuation thereof in order to affect the financing or refinancing of the object or purpose described in section one thereof or a portion thereof by a bond or note issue of said city in the event of a sale of same to the New York State Environmental Facilities Corporation. And section eight, the validity of such bonds and bond anticipation notes may be contested only if one, such obligations are authorized for an object or purpose for which the said city is not authorized to expend money or two, the provisions of law which should, should be compiled with the date of publication of this resolution are not substantially complied with and an action suit or proceeding contesting such validity is commenced within 20 days after the date of such publication or three such obligations are authorized in violation of the provisions of the constitution section nine this resolution shall constitute a statement of official intent for purposes of treasury regulations section 1.150-2 other than as specified in this resolution no monies are or are reasonably expected to be reserved allocated on a short on a long-term basis or otherwise set aside with respect to the permanent funding of the object or purpose described herein. Section 10, this resolution, which takes effect immediately, shall be published in summary form in the official newspaper together with a notice of the city clerk 
in substantially the form provided in section 81 of the local finance law. Section 11. The bond resolutions adopted November 16, 2021, and September 6, 2022, relating to water system improvements, are hereby repealed and rescinded, except to the extent any expenditures have been made previously pursuant thereto. Motion number five that the Common Council approves the amendment to the 2023 part time positions wage scale previously approved on December 6, 2022, to revise the position previously known as Emergency Management Administrator to now reflect a title of Emergency Management Specialist to be established at grade DT 4. Motion number six of the Common Council approves the purchasing agent's recommendation to award the bid for fuels delivered and vehicle fuels to the sole responsive bidder, Rabideau Energy Products and Services, Binghamton, New York, based upon unit price and bid per the attached detail, effective March 8, 2023, through March 7, 2024. And finally, Motion number seven that the Common Council approves the purchasing agent's recommendation to award the bid for propane for the lowest responsive bidder, Nolan Bottle Gas Company Incorporated, Ravina, New York, based on unit prices bid per the attached detail effective March 8, 2023 through March 7, 2024. Are there any motions to be removed? Do I have a motion? Right. Oh, Glenn, sorry. Number three, Len, is that where you're going for? And number three, Paul. Number three? Number three. Mm -hmm. All right. So we have a motion to approve. So oh, wow. Got a Emily, got Mark, and uh, the Sabres group. Yes, right. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Be nice. Um, Councilmember Murphy. Aye. Councilmember Davies. Yes. Councilmember Rickford. Yes. Councilmember Rachel. Aye. Councilmember Carson. Yes. Councilmember Harrington. Yes. Councilmember Raster. Yes. Councilmember Falcon. Um, okay, motion number three. Do we have a motion to approve? Is that Katie? Yeah. Oh, by Mark. Um, and Len, um, this is all yours. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just I pulled this because I had requested more background information on this. There, I believe there's two tables that go with this piece of legislation, and I had asked for them last week and didn't receive them. And I just want to make sure I understand fully what is being asked and changed within this piece of legislation. Steve, can you answer that? What, what, what is he talking about the R2? That there's no, there are no tables, there's no charts or tables for our as part of this ordinance. So I don't know. I responded to an email to that effect. There was no data. Um, within the piece of legislation, it talks about tables 300 dash 67, is that correct? Bolton use tables. There's no chance of Bolton use tables. I'm sorry, it's 300 7 and 300 70. Is that right? No, that doesn't sound right. 300 92 and 300 94, I think, are the two tables. Yeah, there's no change to those tables. And so the already Steve, right. So then the, the only thing we're changing is what to the piece of legislation from what's on the books already then. So the only thing we're changing in this legislation is we're removing a section of code that says if a property sits vacant for two years, it has to be converted back to a single family home. So it's not allowing any new uses, it's just saying we're not going to automatically make someone cut a five unit apartment into a single family home if it sits vacant for two years. Okay. It's just removing the clause that makes these things um, like 
have to return to a conforming unit to their data. So you're saying if a, if a house has been long standing, a multifamily, yep. by removing this portion of the legislation, removing that time period of two years, it allows the, the new owner, the existing owner to, to capitalize under the multifamily. Yeah, so the, the existing ordinance previously said, if you have a house, like let's say someone dies and it gets tied yep. up in a state, if it sits for 24 months, that house had to be converted back to single family home, even if it was built as a two unit house in 1902. Right. So the point of this legislation is to basically say, look, that's that's not that's counterproductive. It's not what we're in reality, we're not seeing those types of conversions, and it doesn't make sense to make those types of conversions. So let's just take that out of the code. Okay, thank you. Further discussion. Councilmember Murphy. Aye. Councilmember Davies. Yes. Councilmember Risberger. Yes. Councilmember Carter Jim. Aye. Councilmember Carson. Yes. Councilmember Hamilton. Councilmember Walker. Yes. Councilmember Falco. Aye. Terrific. All right. We'll move on to the discussion agenda with motion number eight. Motion that the Common Council approve the purchasing agent's recommendation. Award the bid for paving markings contract 2023 G003 to the lowest response bidder. Bolovich, paving markings. Did I get that right? Close enough. Mm -hmm. LLC Endicott, New York, in the amounts of 109,700, uh, around $373.80 for 2023. $46,230.60 for 2024 and $46,002 for 2025 for a total of $201,606.40. So I have a motion to approve that uh, paid followed by Amy and uh, discussion. Okay. Yeah, I'm super excited about this. I mean, the city definitely needs it. My question, I guess, is about like the process of awarding this contract. So these numbers are like very specific. So have they bid on, like, did we give them like a list of everything that needs to be done? So basically we put together a list of all the lines throughout <laughs> the city, parking lots, all the various parking lots, parking garage, um, Long lines, which are like our center, you know, you have center yellow line, um, parking on street parking um, lines. Basically, quantified all of those when you showed maps in the bid, and they basically put a bid together based on all the quantities that we estimated. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. So just to expand on that a little bit, we'll pay based on the actual unit. You know, okay. quantities put down, but it should be pretty close to that. Okay. But John, John especially, and Chris have put a lot of work into that document. It's a big document that has every line we think in the city. Okay. Cool. It'll make it a lot easier to move forward. Great. Um, just a quick question. Um, since it's hard when you mentioned the painting lines and the parking garage, can you start the structure there? Probably. That's something we, we may or may not do. Okay. And so, you know, I just yeah. wonder if it's in the city's best interest to invest in painting lines for. So, so it's going to be kind of then like you're going to decide, like, because it's like she said, these, like Katie said, these kind of are really specific. Do you already have it planned exactly what you're going to do for you? Generally, we do, yes. Then we have everything. The quantity we quantify are for every single line that has is planned for the city. So, so you're not committed to keeping lines in the parking lot. We can negotiate with them. Yes, we're not committed to that. Yeah, the, the bid award is, is based on the specific quantities we include in the bid. They put a unit price, so that's why it's so specific. But we can tell them we're going to change the scope here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Good. That's a good question. Any um, additional questions or comments before we move on to vote? So we can go over. Councilmember Murphy? Aye. Councilmember Davies? Yes. Councilmember Rittberger? Yes. Councilmember Carson? Aye. Councilmember Carson? Yes. 
Councilmember Hansen? Yes. Councilmember Rafferty? Aye. Councilmember Becker? Aye. Perfect. All right, we'll move on to motion number nine, that the Common Council authorizes the mayor to enter an agreement to retain the firm of Whiteman, Osterman, and Hannah LLP to assist the city with the evaluation and potential establishment of alternative financing mechanisms to encourage economic development and or for infrastructure improvements in the city of Oneonta, such as a local development corporation. The initial retainer amount will be $15,000 with payments to be made based on the hourly rates assigned to the particular lawyers and legal assistants performing the work in accordance with the agreement and the council further authorizes the necessary budget transfer from the general fund contingency. So I have a motion to approve. Uh, John, followed by uh, Emily, and discussion. Can you give a little bit more information about this to the council? About the LDC? Yeah. Um, yeah, this is something I'm going to speak for you, Len, but uh, please do jump in. Uh, this has been something that has been a uh, hot topic for um, the Economic Development um, Committee for months and months and months. So the LDC is going to provide us with a, a lot of uh, flexibility that uh, we're going to um, pass off now to um, our city attorney to kind of embellish on. Yeah, I'm not sure what, what the questions, what questions about an LDC I can answer mm -hmm. for you. It's a, it's a hybrid entity that authorizes the city to set up a separate and, and quasi independent not a profit corporation which can do things that municipalities can't do. It can own it can own property, it can borrow money, um, it can it can apply for grants or state grants. Um, it's it does things that neither the IDA nor um, nor a an authority uh, nor a not profit corporation can do. Um, it can uh, there's a NICOM has a 21 yeah, page 20. publication like they're doing some of the other things, which I'd be happy to forward to each and every one of you if you would like. I I had I had offered at some point to get to pass you out lots of pieces of paper that you would agree, but we'll see if we're trying. But it it's a it, it because it because it can be so many things, um, it's kind of hard to encapsulate. So if I was going to just if I was going to just um, describe this, I suppose, and Nikon, you know, again, they they invested the um, energy in providing uh, this tool in terms of its and understanding what this tool is. Um, it is potentially something that can be used for any number of purposes as the city determines that it is going to need. An assistance in, in, in economic development or in any number of other uh, avenues that the city government will not allow it to do. So other cities and a number of other cities have taken advantage of putting this tool in their toolbox. We don't actually know. In fact, there was an LDC uh, that already existed that expired uh, during uh, previous mayor's term and uh, it wasn't used. We do not know how this is going to be used, but as you, I'm sure, heard me talking about, this is a very unique time where we're going to need to be creative. So to have tools and the law firm's uh, specific responsibility is to navigate through any potential that we may be able to use this for that the city might not normally be able to be impacting of, it, of our economic development that we might be able to use this tool, but not to make mistakes to be able to follow the lead of somebody who can tell us what the precedents have been, what the you know what the path is that we need to follow, and that's that's essentially the um, the the production value of the the uh, the candidate then is not so much the construct of the LDC that's not that big a deal, but rather it's if we are going to use this as those opportunities may present themselves we don't what, know what they may be but as those opportunities pre present themselves that we have somebody who's knowledgeable and has done this and can take us through and ensure that we are not putting ourselves either at risk or not taking full advantage 
of the potential of the LDC. And so that's what this contract is all about. Yes, Mark. The primary kind of scope of work, if the goal is to um, contract this particular group to create an LDC, um, and right there, and it says that basically this is being used for, for lawyers and legal assistance. I mean, is this not work that our city attorney could be able to do if it's the background of creating an LDC? That's question number one. And question number two, kind of related to that, is um, it says that this particular group is evaluating a potential establishment of, of alternative financing mechanisms. I guess I'm just I'm, I'm confused by what are they exactly doing? Are they creating an LDC or are they doing evaluation of other potential mechanisms? Um, yeah, well, first of all, let me let Greg answer the question about um, which attorney would be working on what and, and the why of that. Yeah, I mean, our initial discussions with them and the reason we reached out to the White House turn in is because there's some permit to work in the past. Um, it is to look at an LDC. What are the next steps that we would need to take to either reestablish or reactivate or complete the creation of the LDC? And then, like the mayor was saying, what exactly might be important? I think that brings us back to more discussion with council as to what is our strategy. What is our potential strategy? How it might evolve in LDC? Um, the reason I worded it that way as far as alternative financing mechanisms, there are other things such as tax increment financing that I would like to learn more about. And a firm like this, I think, might be able to advise us on that. I think the main goal of, of this hire is to look at the LDC. I want to look open to, to explore if there are other, maybe better suited, suitable mechanisms for the city to explore. And this then, so I'm going to just kind of piggyback on that for a, a quick second. So this, these folks, this is in their realm of experience, whereas you know, we, we love our city attorney, you know, we appreciate you over there, David, but we can't expect him to be, uh, you know, to have an expertise in every single area. They have this expertise. And so um, they would be contracted within the context of whatever action it may come out of economic development committees, um, you know, meetings, or it may come from other, some other, um, you know, some other avenue. Um, how do we want to use this? Can we use it? We don't know. Um, you know, how far can we go with something like this? Uh, what do we need? What mechanisms do, what partners potentially do we need to bring to that? We, we, have, we have any number of questions and we have questions that don't, we don't even know we have yet. And what we're doing is essentially hiring a Sherpa guide. So if I can follow up on that, please. My apologies, Scott. Um, oh, that's all right, because you're probably asking some of the things I was thinking. <laughs> so it, is there a deliverable expected with this? Is this $15,000 mean that at the end of this process that you will, so I'm hearing that there's two particular kind of goals of, of this particular investment, um, well, this contract in this firm. One, that we will have an LDC. Is that the expectation? Yes. Signed, sealed, delivered, approved by the state LDC. Secondly, then it is kind of an overview of alternative um, mechanisms. Is there, a, is there a deliverable expectation of that, that there might be some type of report that would be generated from this particular partnership that would allow us to understand um, these kind of um, you know, alternative uh, kind of you know, financing mechanisms operation? I think for part number one, definitely deliverables should be functional LBC with the various policy bylaws. Major political policy, distribution policy, those certain things that need to be set up for that function. Uh, I think that's the main part of it where most of the expense is going to go. I, I can't really answer the second part. I'm not sure if there would be need for deliverable. You know, I think it's really a matter of having these conversations as to whether there's any need to look further into tax increment financing or something else out there that I don't understand. I, I just I just forwarded everybody on the council the the uh, the handbook on operations. Lays, lays out in long form all of the all of the things that can be found. Right. Yeah, I have no question about the LDC. I certainly understand the LDC needs to invest in my ability. I'm just trying to understand what this fifty thousand is going to get us. And I ask from the standpoint of I appreciate my law and everything else that needs to be present. Having started up my own LLC, LLC, 
Uh, is it also going to be though that they're going to see this process through to the interns of the state registry for the state and all that? Because you know, by law, they're even be able to create. I'm not really interested that if this results in an LEC that's approved by the state register for the state and all that legal education needs to take place there. That's one thing versus the creation of bylaws or other types of forms of, of operation. Yes, I think so. I'm just okay. reading from the from the proposal and maintaining five one C two staff registration. The, the answer the answer is we're not we're not gonna create one until we know what what we're gonna put in the requirements of the LDC. We're not gonna we're not gonna create a framework and then decide what we're gonna put in it. We're gonna talk about what it is that we need to develop the LDC for. Mm -hmm. And then create then then create the framework for how the need rather than create the framework first and then decide and decide how we're going to fit the need into the framework. If you, if you see what I'm saying, we, 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 we can saying. Wait and create a shell, but but if the shell doesn't have the flexibility to do what it is that we need to do, then then it then you just waste the creation of the shell. Then you got to change it. Um, yep. Again, I, I don't know if I'm articulating. I, I think you are. It's also, it's also very malleable. It's, it's so it, it, it's it's not rigid. It's not one thing. Uh, it's it's a um, it can be used creatively to address any number of different if different um, desires of of the city, uh, to, especially around spurring economic development as they arise. But we we don't know what they are yet, and and so you know it's a long. It would be you know in I think in my mind's eye, I think you know most of us a, a, a process that evolves as um, we wind up with director from economic development committee or director um, from wherever um, that we may be able to take advantage of some of the many things. Um, that this can do. It's not a binary choice. It does this or it does something else. The other thing is that different from an LLC, it's actually a 501c3. So we have that here. Right. Yeah. Certain yes. And so let me reframe my question. And maybe I'm going about it wrong. Maybe not that the answer would be. I just want to know that, I guess, let me ask this. If we're to go down this road and do this, will we at some other point be brought forward with a new uh, motion asking us to spend X amount of money to be able to take whatever entity they have advised us on and be able to um, you know, legally act upon that or, or get it to be legally recognized? Does this process include any kind of legal recognition of whatever it is that you're, you're doing? I, I think I mean it's that. The, the answer is yes. This is, it, it's not that we're paying a flat fee. This is the this is the estimate based on what we're allocating in order to use their services in order to get us what we want. So it's not like we're paying fifteen thousand bucks and then they're going to do X, Y, or Z. This is the this is a set list of of criteria and based on who we choose to interact with to get us where we want to be. But it it, it can certainly include the creation of, of an LBC as well. But th this isn't this isn't a a, a cap. This is a burned retainer. This is a cap on what we're going to get based on from the bottom coming up. Like, oh, I'm telling you, it's it's the, we're not paying them this, and then then they're doing it. We're we're talking to them and burning our money as we spend time and energy with them in order to get an LLC that we want. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, further questions, Scott? Do you have any? Yeah, I guess now I'm a little confused here, but <laughs> so this is just the first part of establishing, but there's going to be another motion to come back when it's when they tell us what they found and what we can do to accept what they say, correct? I would, I would. It's tough to answer. I mean, it, it, if there's some reason for us to not move forward with creating an LDC based on our discussions, I mean, we just stop. I think the intent with $15,000 spending all of that would get us to a fully function you know, established. We're essentially having consultants to, to discuss with us the options that are, that are allowed, what we can do, what we can't do, what we can do with this, we can't do with something else. So then would there be 
who would have the oversight on this if we voted to do this? Who would, who's got the ultimate control if we all of a sudden are like, no, they're going to be it depends, it depends on how we set it up. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be set up by the city with city appointed people. It can be independent, it can be independently run, but but generated by us, but then then, then run independently. It's a not for profit. It can, be, it can become many different things. And that's one of the things that we're trying to, to so work with these that folks would... uh, is to is to determine what makes the most sense. And then once we have it, how we're going to set it up and how we're going to set it free and how many tethers we're going to have on it and who's going to control it. The common council can control it. The question that's... is what you really want to be the ones who control it. So that's what I'm asking. So there's, there's got to be another motion to come back to say who's going to control this thing. Yeah. Yes. yes. We will we'll wind up. We don't know what we're doing. Well, that's how I, I've heard that. You've said it like three times. Right, right. I get that. I just So when we do know what we're doing, then the council is going to want to be involved in, in approving. Put it this way. Nobody else should have the authority to set up an LGC by the city other than by authority of council. Yeah, that's, I guess I just didn't ask it the right way, Dave. Thanks. That's. I guess that's what I was getting at was who has the you know the ultimate authority to say, yes, we're doing this or no, we, we don't agree to do this. Yeah, okay. only only the council would have the authority to allow the council, the city, to create an LBC. Yeah. And the only other thing I, I really got is I think I'm not <laughs> I'm not sure I'm real comfortable with taking the money out of the the general fund contingency, but I guess when we get to my vote, I'll. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, our city attorney for sending this um, info out from NICOM about LBCs. Um, but I, I wish we had had this before our finance committee meeting. I think this explains a lot. I mean, there's it's only 21 pages. I've read a couple of them while we've had this discussion here, which is helpful. Um, so my next question is, Greg, is there a rush on this? Is there any reason why we need to rush this? Or Mayor, is there a rush on this? There's no rush, but I think that um, many of us would like to see that we have a, a tool in place more sooner than later, but there's no, no well, rush. What I would suggest is maybe we want to table this to the next meeting, give people a chance to read through this yeah. real quick. It may answer a lot of questions. We certainly do. So, so I would make a motion that we table this. Motion. I'll second that. Well, the voice comes you were allowed to see it. Yeah. All right. Um, and so we've got a motion to table. Further discussion on that? No, we don't have your case. I corrected myself before I finished the sentence. Um, so we'll take a vote. Councilmember Murphy? Aye. Councilmember Davies? Yes. Councilmember Risberger? Yes. Councilmember Larry Sheen? Aye. Councilmember Carson? Yes. Councilmember Harrington? Yes. Councilmember Raptor? Yes. Councilmember Barber? Aye. Okay, so we are unanimous in tabling. We'll see if we can bring this back after you. Uh, and folks um, will have an opportunity to read this uh, and we'll put back a video in the next one. Thank you. All right. Moving on to motion number 10 um, that the Common Council authorizes the submission of a grant application to the staffing for adequate fire an emergency response safer program as administered by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, DHS, Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, for the reimbursement of salary and benefits for up to four full-time firefighters for three years. In addition, the council authorizes the mayor to enter an agreement in the amount of $1,500 with G&G Process Services Incorporated and support New York to assist with preparation and submission of the grant application by a motion to approve. Katie, followed by Mark Davies and discussion for this. Katie. Excuse me, is the intention to hire more firefighters or be reimbursed for existing positions? Um, this would be hiring four additional firefighters. We have budgeted seven person crews, four crews, 28 firefighters, plus the chief and assistant making 30. Mm -hmm. um, this would put us to 34 potentially. Okay. Um, given that it's funding for three years with no match, that would give us, you know, essentially three years to make a decision. Are we, we've been talking about seeking alternative funding sources, one of those potentially being providing a, an additional service on top of what we do now, which is hospital ambulance transports on a regular basis. Um, if we're able to successfully implement that, that should bring in additional revenue, which would help pay for these positions for three years. 
uh, without an increased tax burden for the city taxpayers, hopefully having the, the reverse effect. Um, you know, if that didn't work out, then, you know, ultimately we would reduce back to our 27 seven person or seven person per year. Um, I think, you know, she'd have to talk a little bit more about, let's, let's just say that scenario played out you know, having a fully trained staff, I mean, the training that goes into it, a new firefighter, and, you know, when you when you wait for someone to retire and then replace them, it, you've got a gap there. So maybe, maybe I'll just let Brian jump in and talk a little bit more about that. But Yeah, so Judy and I got together and we were looking at the numbers as far as having eight-person crews, uh, and really what we came up with, and I don't want to put words in her mouth, but uh, it seems like by going this direction, with the potential of the added revenue, we're really reducing our risk profile as far as like hiring these four individuals because we're anticipating that there's going to be, I won't say several retirements, but there's going to be retirements with pretty close to that window. So um, right now the academy is 17 weeks, and then from there it's going to be two years of paramedic school. So I mean that window is really being paid for just in training. Um, so whenever we hire someone new, it's setting us back several years, so. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would just like to point out, uh, because <laughs> this was a question last time, I think Len had this question, like, are we gonna have enough people? Um, so previously we had only upper 20s uh, signed up to take our test last year, and we ended up with a list of about 20 to 22, um, and the physical agility test, we did them all out, but through the efforts of the fire department, Carrie, and the HR department, we had 62 sign up for our exam, and 57 either sat with us or cross-filed. Now, we haven't given the physical agility test, so, but knock on wood, we're going to have a good amount of people to, to choose from on this, so. Cool. Further discussion? <clears throat> right, um, Council Member Larkin? Aye. Council Member Davies? Yes. Council Member Ricksberger? Yeah. Council Member McCarthy? Aye. Council Member Carson? Yes. Council Member Harrington? Yes. Council Member Rafter? Yes. Council Member Parker? Aye. So we move on to discussion number uh, item number 11. And that's the University District Zone Code update. And uh, I'd like to just hand this over to you if I could, Steve. Yeah, so we reviewed the comments from last uh, Council Council meeting. Uh, there's basically, we have two options. One is we, well, I guess you have three options. One is we stick with what we had. Uh, two is we change the percentages the common council considered or three is we implement a special use permit process which we drafted uh, a version of but uh, unfortunately that would not entirely eliminate the chances that properties that uh, are eligible to apply for special use permit couldn't apply for special use permits in short-term rental uh, effectively, there's just, there's no way to uh, prevent some units from not being eligible to apply and others similarly situated uh, to apply. So we're we're kind of at that drawing board, I think. Uh, I mean, those conditions exist throughout the city. We permit short-term rental downtown. We permit short-term rental. Uh, in our four zones and two zones, uh, all of our other higher density apartment structure type zones have that option. Uh, we haven't seen a massive turnover in buildings to be rental, but that's not to say it couldn't happen. Um, so that's just the reality, I guess we're looking. Um, implementing the short for the strategy use permit process would at least uh, give the planning commission the ability to review applications for short-term rentals and hold them against criteria like uh, existing conditions in the neighborhood. Does it effectively, or does it, you know, impact or negatively impact the surrounding district? Uh, does it, you know, you, you have a list of criteria that you can measure against. Um, so yeah, I guess that's what you have to discuss. 
So you're advocating for the special use permit direction. Right. If the idea is to <laughs> put layers of review onto any process, putting a special use permit on it is that mechanism. Um, that's why in that original draft, all of the commercial type uses that were in the lowest into the U category had special use permits. Um, and that would just be carried over to that user free zone. Um, yeah, so that would be kind of the process. Uh, we wanted to add layers of review or, you know, administrative processes to regulating special use permits. Uh, that could be across the entire zone. That could just be, we don't do that in any other zone. So we we don't have that regulation in any part of the city right now for short term rentals. Uh, they're just either by right or they're not permitted. Um, I think I understand this view correctly. Could we then with the special use permits um, the fonts and the criteria we use or yep. So the criteria that are commonly used relate to like uh does it uh significantly impact the existing conditions does it is it is there a negative uh impact on surrounding uses i mean there's special use permits are specifically made for things that are not permitted but due to extra controls or or additional oversight could be permitted in certain instances so like what we did for the lower density use zone is we said yeah, we'd love to have a deli. You can have a deli as long as it's goes through the special use permit process. The planning commission reviews like where the parking would be, how the lighting would be, what the signage would look like. So it's a way to control uses that are otherwise maybe not great or maybe not in perfect unity with what's there, but with the right controls could be uh, a useful. Uh, land use in the zone. So play this out against the, the backdrop of you know, what this real issue is here that we're trying to certainly kind of create opportunities but also not um, um you know have it lead to people being removed from their houses or whatever right. it might be. Um so is there a way to be able to kind of write that into criteria that, that so we go back to that percentage piece or something like that. Is there a way to be able to have that as part of the consideration or so I kept the percentage section throughout um, so all the zone, all those transits of that U zone still have that. If you have more than four units, you can't exceed the 75% uh, occupancy of short term rental. Um, I mean, I think you could arguably say that uh, evicting an entire building full of people would be a negative impact on the conditions in the zone and a negative impact on surrounding. Uh, land uses. But what if we did that in ones and twos over several years? Yeah, I mean, that's, there is no way to protect them. And that's to say effectively, I mean, you, I don't know, Dave, if you write an ordinance that says landlords can't evict tenants. No, I mean, the, the, the problem is you be done anyway. I mean, if there's a one year lease, if you have a one year lease, they, uh, if they have month to month tenancies, then you can come out after 30 days. Well, I recognize that, but so, the, the whole thing is that if, if we give an incentive, they take them out. Right. That, that, that's the problem. Short term rental becomes mm -hmm. incentive. If there's no short term rental in place, there's no incentive. Therefore, they're incentivized to try to keep it occupied with people who pay full time rent. Right. So, if this is a needle we need to thread, and I don't think time is really difficult to do this, especially in this particular case. Yep. If there was an easy way, we wouldn't be providing you with your health benefits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, and like I said, those conditions exist throughout the city. I mean, we, have short term rental in one and two are fours. I uh, see. I mean, really, the only zone that doesn't permit short term rental is R1 and R2, R3s, and then uh, U District doesn't, but so much of it is SUNY and Hartwick that it effectively does. So we've created a, a zone that, through, through use variances, we've effectively made the U zone. Uh, Allow short term rentals. Um, yeah, so those are kind as of as long as they want to do it. They, you know, it's like as soon as they do it, they can do it. Yeah, everyone wants to do it, they can do it. There's nothing we can do about it. But, 
and they've had different beta genomes and functionally short term. Yeah, right. And Steve, with the special use permit notion that you're um, suggesting, then what we're doing is we're giving the planning commission some ability to weigh in um, for the you know for the betterment of the neighborhood. Yeah, I mean the planning commission would, would be reviewing an individual application. Uh, but like I said, Mark to Mark Davies' point, I mean, there's no mechanism to prevent landlords from evicting the tenant. Sure. They can evict all of them tomorrow. But that's just the nature of not having long-term leases. Um, but yeah, I've I've scoured, I have looked, I have done my best to try to find some sort of better solution, but we just we can't write with laws that say you can't have the tenants. I appreciate you looking into it. I mean the other option would be to uh, to arguably, I mean another option would be to make uh one of those units a non-conforming uh use that would be kind of yeah. I think it's my decision right now. <laughs> create a non conformity in your new something code, which is really sensical. We, we have um, other thoughts on the social and other things to yeah. I've been going back and forth about this. I, I, I don't know how, how I feel about a special use permit. I understand the process with it, and that you're looking at does it change the nature of the area. But I look around in my neighborhood in Third Ward and what initially started as um no it doesn't really change the neighborhood over time as you have more and more of them it changed the neighborhood um and it got easier to give these out um so that would be my fear with that I mean I would I mean I would lean more toward if we're going to do this and, and the problem here is that we've got one apartment complex in the Cuban um I would lean toward doing the lowering percentage that is allowed to have short term medicals rather than no more than 75%. I mean, flip it, no more than 25%. Um, but it's the only thing I would say to that, and I appreciate that. In fact, I even think I suggested it uh, the last time we were together and then thought about. Um, one of the things we're trying to do here is to take pressure off the center city for um, these, you know, short-term rentals during the summertime. Uh, and yeah. to dissuade people from the law entrepreneurial from buying the bar housing stuff. But I'm going to counter that with that. However, I get that, and I, I like that, but then we create another you know, yeah. you know that we would pension. And it's, it's, it's a case of which, you know, it's not a perfect scenario here there I mean, there's no scenario that we can ever come up with where there isn't some yeah. issue and then it's a case of where do we want to land what, what's what's our bigger issue and the bigger issue in climate is ensuring that we can bring as much housing back to you know the the, the, the folks that that need it long term and that's not going to be available uh, if um, we make this so attractive for entrepreneurs throughout the city, so but I don't know that we. Sorry, no, go ahead. Um, this has probably been answered, and I just don't remember. We can't cut out that one area that includes that apartment complex and keep it out of the youth. So, so what becomes problematic with anything like this is you have two properties that are situated similarly. Right. So then you have to argue that one is and one is not. So. Well, the purpose of both of is very, very different of those two apartment areas. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Like in, in like a logical land, that would be true. But arguably, the, the, the argument from the person suing us would be, well, Hillside Commons is just as much an apartment building as we are. And Hillside Commons could house full-time residents from the town or city just as much as we can. So they you know, know the buildings. Would it not, not make excuse me, but would it not make a difference? There is a distinction between these two buildings. One is renting to college students, and the other is not. That is factually true, but not true. So Hillside Commons opts to rent to students, just like Peter Clark opts to rent 
rents it to. It's, there's no, it's not a dorm, it's an apartment complex. If I wanted to rent a hillside commons, I could put an application in tomorrow and rent a hillside commons. Um, that's just, it's not a dorm, it's an apartment building. So you, you have an apartment building that opts to rent to students. 10 month leases, 12 month leases. I mean, what do they do? Is it so well? They currently do twelve. Uh, they're moving to a ten month lease. Um, I I think. Um, but the problem is, is that that's again just the the way a landlord can opt to make a ten month lease. They can make a thirty day lease. I mean, there's there's factually no difference between these two buildings, other than the fact that they opt to rent to a certain person or certain. Clientele, just like Chip Blue off is not really rent the students, and Peter Clark off to rent the students. I mean, they're, they're the same thing. They're the market buildings. So if I'm suing the city, I'm going to say, well, this building is the same as that building. <clears throat> We're literally adjacent to one another. Why am I not allowed to and they are? So that makes it really easy argument. Do we run into that with special use permits too? Like if we were to issue a special use permit to one but not the other? Personal permit? That's why you have the criteria that you're supposed to do. But how do we differentiate between the two? Well, that's what you say. That. One property is occupied by 10 month leases and their students, or they're, they move out in the summer, but this building does not. I mean, that's where you can get them like the nitty gritty of what makes those two buildings different. Okay. But you know, that's kind of subjective. Kind of subject, subjective. Don't, don't you're, you're pushing, you're pushing me in the court here, pal. You know, <laughs> you no, know, I mean, so like special use permits are at the review of the planning commission. And they have to be rationally based. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're, they, they're, they're a quasi judicial entity which looks at specific circumstances. But although we're saying on the one hand, all the parcels, that all parcels are similar. Every single piece of land philosophically is different. There are no identical pieces of land. You know, different, there are different distances. Every single piece of property everywhere is a different distance from the spine. You know, so so you have you have those that have similar characteristics, mm -hmm. and that's how we set up zoning. Is that we we make a philosophical determination that's for the community best interest to to provide things. And activities in this particular geographic area that aren't benefited in the other geographic area, but cumulatively having the factories here and the and the hotels here and the and the retail merchants over here, the single family residents over here, but regulating that there's an ultimate unifying benefit to the entire community as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, if there, but if you're saying there are edges and there are situations where having all the houses here. That doesn't mean like you can't have a gas station in the middle of it, but you know, it might be a good thing to have a gas station. So you say you can have a gas station in a residential area grocery if store. Pardon? grocery stores better. Okay, grocery store. Grocery store. If you have a grocery store and it, but it has to close down at 10 o'clock at night, you have to aim their you have to aim their lights away from all the houses, you have to put fences up. So that's a situation that becomes philosophically. Discussed with a list of criteria that the planning board can, can apply. But you can't just say, I like Bob's over here, and but I don't like Ken over here. That's how you end up in court because the planning board has to be on a rational basis with reasonably articulable criteria <laughs> for saying why it is that this is authorized here, which isn't generally authorized here. I have to get something special. And uh, so when he starts saying, Oh no, we can do this here, 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 here. So. There is one layer um, that I'd like to just kind of lay on top of this, which is <laughs> the idea that well, we don't know, quite honestly, what somebody, landlord of this other building may or may not decide to do. We're, we're saying, worst case scenario, it could be such a question. One of the things that I, I think we're fairly well agreed upon is that as the student rental market becomes mm -hmm. less attractive, and we wind up finding ourselves with a way uh, toward an off-ramp for some of these folks that are taking a loss on some housing where they're expected to be making money. 
that we don't want that to wind up becoming something that is just replaced by baseball cap. So if we are successful in being able to create more housing that's long-term rental in Central City, if there winds up being displacement, we don't know that there is, but if there winds up being displacement in this one building, the the the, the greater I hate to say the greater good, but the, but I guess that is what I'm saying. We're likely to see many more uh, houses and apartments that wind up available in Center City than we would have as we start to you know move slowly through our voting strategies here and try to push the Cooperstown All Star Village rentals more to the periphery. If they don't, if the landlords don't have an option or making a different sort of an income, then those houses are gonna be much more attractive to become market rate houses at $1,200 a month or, or even uh, houses that are uh, sold to those who are looking for houses. So, so I'm sorry, I have to counter that. I feel like there's some assumptions being made there that have a challenge. Um, um, so for one, um, it is the assumption that by opening up uh, the, the um, short-term rentals in another area, that things are going to move, and I don't see that at all. In fact, I think it, it, they'll there will be more use there, but we're not going to get rid of the existing use, especially as we're looking at having a baseball world, whatever it's called, um, expand. So we're looking at expanding numbers there. If there'll be more people, it's going to just bring more people in there. I don't know this to create a movement and then an opening of position. I just don't simply see that. So that is an assumption based on. It's just not based on the logic that I feel comfortable with, but we can make the assumption on the other side that there might be a greater possibility that a landlord would see short-term rentals as a as a you know huge moneymaker for their their business, and and that to me um, is more concerning. I, I would love to be able to solve some of the issues that you're trying to talk about here, but I don't know that this is the solution. I do think it opens up a greater problem that would have a bigger impact on people, um, especially those people that are trying to rent at a particular price point for that. Um, that's my concern with this. Um, I would be in favor of a very low percentage, putting on the record there, or as is. I'm just not comfortable with the higher percentage uh, and especially the that. I think it opens up a group of folks right now who are vulnerable from the standpoint that they're already renting either month to month or, or um, you know, yearly, and there's not a lot of alternatives, period. And so if we are creating something where they are much more vulnerable and those alternatives don't exist for them, what happens for them? Do they leave our area? Do they not take jobs in our area? That's my concern. I would love to try to understand, to figure out a solution to the other issue. I'm not against that. I just don't want to try to find one solution that might work, might not. And at the same time, open up another problem that we know could potentially be a real problem for quite a few residents. That's my concern. I, I get that. Uh, I do. Uh, there are assumptions, but there are there also is an expectation that we are going to wind up with more development. There is an expectation that we are going to wind up with more empty houses if we're able to move folks to that, you know, to that notion. Especially those folks that are, you know, landlords from outside of the area that are just looking at those houses, don't even know those houses. If they would recognize them, they. If they saw them, but they're losing money on them. So there is there's an opportunity. There's clearly an opportunity to change some mindset around uh, some basic business strategies for folks that are likely to open up housing. And beyond that, as I said, we are engaged in the in in the capture of developers, and that again is going to wind up being something that enhances the numbers of options that people have. One of the things that we do want to do. I, in my mind's eye, is provide as much of an opportunity to 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 push the um, to, to take the pressure off the center city and to push people to the periphery, um, so that while we, we they may either be in the town or they may still be in the city, but we aren't we aren't causing more undue stress and more um, disconnection within that context of the neighborhood. So yes, it's an assumption, but it's also part of a strategy that. We either think it's going to work or we don't. I guess I would love to think about the strategy differently. Appreciate it out there. I, I, I don't I don't mind the strategy in terms of what the focus on Center City. I'm just afraid of the other unintended outcome. So, Mark, you're yes. saying you're going to push this, so you're just going to push the problem to the 
<clears throat> to other wards if yeah. that's what you're going to open up. Because you just said you're going to push, you're going to take this off the center city and you're going to push it. Well, you're going to push it outside. What's that? If you're suggesting that we're talking about the six ward or something, no, we're not. No, I was just saying in general, if you're going to push it, eventually you're going to push the problem somewhere else. Yeah. Well, it so is, I mean, it is. It's going to it's going to end up from Center City out to whether it's first ward to the far side, fifth ward to the far side, sixth ward down there. I mean, if you're going to push it, you're you are literally saying you're pushing it to the periphery of the. Well, it's coming one way city, to so. I mean, so I'm I'm kind of I'm on board with Mark. You're just gonna you're kicking the can down the road and moving that problem from one spot to another. There is there is no doubt that there will be a an escalating strain on our housing market for people who will see the benefit of being able to rent short term during the summertime, uh, and that is likely to happen in all wards. So it's, it's that this is I'm not proposing a solution. I don't have a solution. What we know we don't want is to replicate what you see in so many communities, the, the road to Milford, where, you know, there just aren't people living there. And, and we need to be able to, I mentioned in my, in my address, we need to be able to encourage the, the creation of neighborhoods throughout the city. Which I understand, but like, if you're looking for housing, this is all centered around housing. We need to get... So we can have people come settle in the city, grow to get to whatever population we're hoping to get to. But if you push the short term rentals down, aren't aren't you just you're not really taking care of the problem? Right. I'm assuming that this all started because we have we're worried about an influx of short term rentals. Right. And not being able to have people live here all year round. That's, that, that's accurate. So again, I just think if you're from just what you said, and I may be misunderstanding what you're saying, but if you're taking from center city and you're saying we're going to push this out, well, then you're going to push it out to all the other wards. You're going to have the first ward, the fifth ward, the sixth ward affected by it. I unless I'm misunderstanding what yeah, you're saying. This is so. I appreciate that. I think you are. Um, we're we don't have this we don't have solutions right um and you know we, we don't we know that we have this use on opportunity right now with one building that can accommodate i don't know 60 families per week which is a significant number and it's and it's a value to the city to have that that, that happen we don't know and i don't know that we've entertained the conversation uh, as to what we might look at as a solution to the stress that short-term rentals may have as the coach tunnels of those continue to expand. Of course, we love them. We want their foot traffic, but we also don't want to turn into a, a community that doesn't have people living here. So I don't have an answer, but, but looking at the U-Zone specifically as being a place where we know we have you know, one opportunity to take a, a significant amount of stress in this moment off of Center City while student landlords are learning of, you know, their new reality, their new paradigm. This is a moment where I feel like, again, it's not a perfect solution. Just one more thing then. Sorry, Dave, just one more thing. Steve, what, what do you, in your opinion, what is, I don't want to say the easiest, but what is better for the codes and how you can enforce things? What, what would, like, if we were going to pass something, what would you like to see us pass? I mean, there's really no, I mean, there's, there's, it's, Kind of like Dave said, I mean, it's more of a philosophical question as to like what the council wants to do. Like you've asked me to come up with zoning recommendations. I brought you zoning recommendations. I mean, we can enforce the code as is. We can change the code. I mean, it's you know, it's it's a law. I mean, that's why I brought you the options that I did. Um, 
it's a question about like what you want to legislate. Like I can't give you a yes, pass this law because it's easy for me to enforce. I mean, that's you know, that's not really I I don't want to say that's not my job, but I mean I brought you, you asked me to develop zoning options and I had to come up with zoning options. Uh all of them are easy to enforce. Okay. We sit on Airbnb and we send tickets. I just want to respond to you, Scott, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but right now, anybody can rent their house out that they live in for a certain amount of time over the summer. So that exists already in the sixth ward. Um, I understand. So when the mayor's talking about pushing, taking the pressure off Center City, I'm assuming you're talking about moving some of these rentals yeah. up the hill. Yes, that's right. Um, the, the problem lies in that other apartment complex. Um, now, remind me again, the other apartment complex, are they 12 month lease or are they one month lease? They have a one year lease that they signed up initially for. And okay. then it appears like it's a 30 day. Mm -hmm. So they have the option. I think part of it is that the tenant then has the option to leave without punishment, but also theoretically the landlord could arrange. Right. right. And now, why is and I think I mean that's based off the website. That's what based off us looking at their in Hillside Commons is is moving. Like you are sure that they're going from a twelve month lease to a ten month lease? They appear to be happy <laughs> to that. Okay, and why are they doing that? Why did they switch? I so from what I understand, they really don't have any people that are living there year round. Like it's it sounds like they literally are not. They like keep their stuff there over the summer. Right, but there's got to be more to why they would change from a 12 month lease to a 10 month lease um, than saying, well, nobody's here, let's just change it to a 10 month lease. I, I don't know. I, I'm not part of those site comments. What do you mean, Mr. Ravens? Mayor, are you aware of the reason why they're changing? I'm, I'm not, except anecdotally, just um, general conversation, but I, I, I would imagine um, that. You don't wind up in a scenario where sometime in August somebody uh, comes in uh, because they have a 12 month lease. Well, you might be renting it out to, um, you know, a baseball camp. I mean, my, my question is kind of rhetorical because I'm, I'm assuming that I guess what I want to know is did they come to the city and ask us to change the zoning up at Hillside Commons to allow them to rent over the summer? Did they come to the city? No, I can tell you they did not come to the city. I guess. Uh, Going back to our choices, then, I mean, I would I would not be in favor of special use permits. I'd be in favor of changing it to a percentage. Um, I'm I'm a low percentage because I'm very worried about what's going to happen to the apartment complex, and I think it could turn into a, a scenario where we have two large apartment complexes renting out in the summer in a very convenient spot, but suddenly we have. At least maybe initially, and initially could be for a few years, we have even less appropriate housing for people. That's that's my fear. Yeah. Um, just for the record, I'd like to echo that. Um, I'm kind of wondering if maybe I don't know, like wondering if maybe like both might be helpful to have like lower percentage and then. If you wanted to rent above that, it would require a special use permit. So then it's kind of evaluated. Like, um, because what was I? Oh, and I'm wondering also if there's any way to kind of um make it so that you it's more of an advantage to rent to someone year round. Say, for instance, if there's some kind of tax or fee that if you exceed this certain percentage, you're expected to pay, you know, higher because obviously you're probably going to be, you're going to be breaking a little bit more money if you're have all these short-term rentals. So it kind of like, you know, you have to decide then is this really worth it for me or, you know, also with a headache, you know, doing Airbnb, I would imagine like, you know, like it's like managing a hotel, you know, so and then, you know what I mean? Like, is there some way to make it? I, I don't know your thoughts on that, maybe? Or? I just want to respond to that. I mean, I appreciate what you're saying, and I, I sort of know the avenue you're going in, but I 
did some of the figures here based on what I know of George and Redwoods over the summer, and they are they could potentially earn in the summer um, per apartment the same amount that they gain, or actually more than they gain the entire year for an apartment in one in one in eight weeks over the course of the years. So the the fee that we would have to give would have to be really, really high yeah. to disincentivize them. And if they pay it, it still doesn't help us keep a With family a in that apartment. Like we gain money, but you know, big deal if we have fewer places to put people. So right. Well, maybe with the new um LDC, we can open my phone. <laughs> I, I know. I, I, I know. Yeah, it's a bit tricky. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. It seems to me that we're going through these discussions as exercise for basically two properties. And correct me if I'm wrong. It just that's what it boils down to. I'm with others that have already voiced their concerns. I could see doing the flip of from 75 to 25 percent that way we would have some time to evaluate how this goes down because I'm actually not only concerned for the residents that live in Woodridge today and potentially could have an opportunity tomorrow to live there full time but I'm also concerned about the small business owners that have already um, put out hundreds of thousands of dollars um, into this tourist business already. I've had a, a couple of them approach me and um, and once they had heard our discussion before, they were like, are you taking into consideration those of us that have already went out and, and financed, becoming a small business owner and financed to do this? So they're, they're now also, um, instead of two, we're gonna be hurting many of those um, small business owners in the, in the city of Oneana. So for me, I, I would feel comfortable doing 25% if that's what we're getting this boiled down to rather than um, at 75%. 25% being a rental side of things? I mean, short term? Yeah, going to short term rental for 25. And to Emily's point, I, I know Dave and others don't like to. The um, special use permit, but there's nothing that stops those businesses, those two businesses, those two entities. And also, you know, one of those entities, their clientele list might have dropped. What stops them? What precludes them from renting out to full time residents of the city of Oneana? Yeah, Other um other thoughts, questions, discussion on this? Is there um, any appetite for a 50-50 uh, split or are we locked into 25 75? I don't even know we're locked into 25. I think we're locked right. in below. Yes. No, I'm just getting us sent to the oh I'll give me an answer. Not not bad. Bad. I'm very prompt to get answers. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we need to give um Steve, the the directive at this point, that's the end of this conversation, is to give him the directive. Um, so there is some appetite, not a lot of appetite, in every quarter um, for a 25-75 split. But there is some appetite in some quarters. Um, Are there any other percentage um, notions that Anybody wants to float outside of the zero one hundred percent. So, so yes, go ahead. Too quickly, I would have to look at that a little more carefully um, and try to understand what that means in raw numbers mm -hmm. um, before I would really want to agree to a, to a, a number itself. I would want to understand what's that impact in terms of what's twenty five percent of what. Um, so, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Over twenty percent, fifty percent. I'd like to know, understand again what that raw number of of, of of apartments that we're talking about, and what would be the impact. So, Steve, is that something that you might be able to help on? Yeah, I mean, I would have to go through the files to figure out the exact numbers in each building. 
Um, I mean, I have that information in my office. Uh, is that something that you feel like maybe you know Tuesday we might be able to? I could get all Tuesday more work. That would be one that says if we got a computer. There are you know there are folks that are in other areas of the country that want to know if they are renting. You know that that's a, that's that's a concern with that with the calendar, you know, the clock taking the calendar moving. So I don't want to rush anybody uh, on anything. Well, wait, but I'm I sorry, but but people in the other part of the country are talking folks in Oriyata. That's what I thought we were focused. Well, on. no, but I'm but, but but there are people who have kids that are going to be going through the and and they uh, mayor. With all due respect, they're not my concern. I appreciate that. I, I mean, I do uh, have some connections. I appreciate oh, that. I'm really trying to look up red. So I would appreciate that very much. Um, so, yes, I do appreciate it. Nonetheless, um, I would like to think that maybe we can get the information to everybody, Steve, if you're able to. Okay. Uh, tomorrow morning at, I don't know, nine o'clock. That'd be cool. Um, I don't believe there's any further discussion that's going to happen on this topic tonight. Right. One more question. I, I have one more question. Yes. So one property is one building. The other property has six buildings. Is that correct? Yeah, it's like it's like eight separate buildings. I like I said, I have to look at the I have to look at the unit number. I don't know. If and, and so, Steve, did, did you say that it, within the language we would put um, the beginning per, beginning number was four? If you had more than four, was that part of the language? Yeah, I, I picked four and I applied it throughout so that um, some of the larger apartment houses that have more than you know two units would also be restricted. Because we have units that are like five units, six units that aren't necessarily apartment buildings. Okay. Is there the ability to say that um, it would only apply to one structure per parcel? You mean restricting just one part, one unit or one building and not the others? Yeah. Is there, is there that ability to restrict it? Cause I'm just trying to understand that. Question. I'm sorry. That's a good question. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm just wondering if we could just regulate this down to uh, one one structure per parcel. So, what would what would the, so what you're asking is, can we say that only one building on the parcel is, or even percentage of that one building? Uh, right. Parcel. Okay. That would, if we're able to do that, we could potentially affect the apartment complex. With multiple buildings that are currently um, Correct. housing families, and it would still allow the other complex move forward, forward since they're one one building. Okay. Yeah. That seems know. like for for me that seems like a, a very workable solution if we can legally do that. I mean, we typically issue short term rental permits for parcels, not for structures. Like it's for like we don't issue a short-term rental permit for each individual unit. So I guess we would then have to decide if we were gonna then break down that parcel into eight separate short-term rental permits. Right, but we, we really don't have that many other ones. I'm thinking of one um, down in Luke Murphy's um, ward that they, they put up uh, four small, no, it's a four, three, three small buildings. But I, I can't think of too many other parcels in the city that I don't know. Yeah, let me look at it. I'll have to just I'll have to look at it and see what's there and how we can break it apart. Okay, thank you. So not to put undue pressure on you, Steve, but is that something that you think yeah, I can go see? I'll, I'll do it by I'll go tomorrow. I just have to get in front of my computer. Or I have the information on my computer. Very much. Is there anything else that we want to discuss with um, in this motion? In that case, on the supplemental agenda, we have motion number 12. 
that are the results of a cooperative contract through Onondaga County, contract ONG OV 106 19, the common council approves the purchasing agent's recommendation to purchase a 2023 international CV 515 SFA 4x4 with plow in the amount of $124,462.30 from Allegiance Trucks, Liverpool, New York, and the Common Council further authorizes the following budget amendments. From A.7110.2, Parks Equipment, $62,300, to A.5110, Maintenance of Road Equipment, $62,300. From F.1990.480, Waterfront Contingency, $31,100, to F.8340.2, Transmission and Distribution Equipment, $31,100. From G.1990.480, Sewer Fund Contingency, $31,100, to G.8120.2, Sanitary sewer equipment, $31,100 to act on to approve. Dave, followed by Emily, do we have discussion? Call the roll. Council Member Murphy? Aye. Council Member Davies? Yes. Council Member Richard? Yes. Council Member Richard? Aye. Council Member Carson? Yes. Council Member Harrington? Yes. Council Member Rafferty? Yes. Council Member Davies? Aye. Okay. All right. With that, we go back to um, the agenda. And um, is there any additional business or anything for council discussion, Dave? Yes. Uh, we had talked about on our um, forgetting which committee at this point um, about having uh, Chief Gosenberg come to the entire council to report on what the community solutions panel is up to. Can we? Can he be invited to do that at the next council meeting? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else for council discussion? I have a question. It's late and I'm going to open a whole can of worms, but my question is this. Um, Mayor, in the state of the city, you had mentioned kind of the way forward with the parking garage um, that we're basically planning on demolishing and rebuilding the problem the parcel. I just Feel like we should know that like no council action has been taken oh, on that. Um, and I guess my question is like what I, I know that we were given this timeline, but like um you could just sort of touch us on what the next steps are for that and where we are in that process. That would be great. Sure. Um I know that you asked the question and we haven't responded to that yet. Actually, yeah. I was just looking out because I have a email from Sacramento to uh, that track. But okay. over the next day or so, we can have that response. Okay, good. The next steps forward, what we're doing now is to set the design of this option, which will lead us to developing construction documents and going to bid with the project. Um, you know, there will be additional presentations at some point, whether that's a 50% design and or 60% somewhere around there, we'll be a better idea. But as soon as we fight, it has to We'll come back to the council again and have a discussion. Gotcha. Uh, that's kind of where we're at. Obviously, we're still waiting to hear from the JTOC on the official funding application for transit funding. Uh, a lot of the you know, project kind of hinges on, on how much we get from transit and now whether we can sort of change our scope at all to, to make that a fit. Um, ultimately, it was presented as far as the $10 million borrowing scenario based on our current estimate that's driven by the parking garage. Doing less parking, not having a parking garage, just having a parking lot, which would reduce that number. Doing more parking, additional level, um, which really isn't recommended given the space. Um, and then the amount of parking we have and our analysis of the data, the data um, but that would obviously increase the cost. So, given the path that has brought us here, I'm not sure there's another option that we're actively considering, unless there's an idea or a question that drives us in that direction, if that makes sense. I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but yeah. um, you know, if there's another option that you would like to explore or, or there are thoughts that you have, you know, any questions, you know, anytime you have them, we can discuss more. But right now we're moving forward with design as that presented. Gotcha. 
Well, since you brought it up, Greg. I didn't think that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you said other other oh. things to consider. Oh. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Just listening to some of the, the people's concerns out there and stuff. They they there a lot of them are sitting there saying they still want that third level of that parking garage. I think it would be very beneficial to us to understand how much that would cost. So when we go to them and say, we're going to have to bond this out, this is how much it's going to extra. It's going to be on top of what we got. I think that'd be very, I think that's very fair. Um, Cause I, the other thing that was talking about <clears throat> with a couple of people was, you know, as we're trying to think of revenue sources and stuff like that is what if we sold some of our parking parking lots like Wall Street or um, the one right here next to Rufino's and stuff and and uh, put that back on where they could be developed and stuff like that. Sorry, Steve, I didn't realize I said something funny, but I just... Well, I mean, we, the last time we did that, we got sued. I just want to throw that up on the record. When we tried to sell those parking lots and got people develop it on them, we did sue what we want. I, I get that. I mean, we got threatened to be, yeah, Deach Street, we got we got sued on Deach Street. You're, you're absolutely right. But I think we're victorious. There's a nice apartment, there's a big apartment complex going up there. And that was like deeded to the city, right? Like in someone's trust for public use, which which is different circumstances than the other than the parking lots. Yeah, I guess I was just I was commenting on the fact that an option to sell the parking lots to be developed was something we did and we were actually sued over. That's how supportive the community was. Yeah, I think that was like yeah, but I I understand that. I I get that, but I'm I'm also I get it. I I understand the fr you know it is frustrating when you try to do move forward and you get sued. I get it. Can I just ask a kind of question? I mean, you said you're hearing feedback from residents about essentially wanting more parking to be rebuilt a third level right. in the garage, but also feedback about where is that a like an either or or like both selling off selling off. No, that was a, that was a separate thing of maybe looking at as we're talking about funding sources and stuff of development and stuff like that. And you know, I mean if you know, we're talking about housing and, and stuff like that or businesses or whatever. That that was, you know, a side thing that okay. a couple of people have had. And I don't know if that would take your numbers in, in the hard work. To, I know you've done a lot of work with that. And I didn't know if that would, if like we got rid of those spots, how that would trickle down into all of this. But I do know like out in the public, a lot of people stopped and they're like, we really we want that third third level and i think i think sticker shock would be this is how much more this is going to cost you yeah look at i mean you know from a technical like a design standpoint adding a third level especially in the, the new footprint of the garage is a little bit smaller mm -hmm. you know, width wise when you added ramps on that so now you're the ramps are more expensive and then you're reducing the amount of parking on the water street level to get a ramp up to the third level so it it's just not really the most cost effective thing. Not that it's impossible. We can look at what that cost would be. Um, as we've talked about, the design would be so you can build above with housing, um, which is like what you're saying with the other lots. And you can do the same thing in any of those. I mean, the Westcott lot was originally in the DRI strategic investment plan to be built above um, the, the parking remaining and that became the carning project on Dean Street. So they were looking at a bigger area to put the mechanical. That there is a smaller one of the ones they find us like they do the smaller building. So that's why that happened. That's not to say that that's not allowed to do the work for Wall Street. But I think, you know, we're going through that parking strategies task force, things we've been looking at. Um, I think, you know, Emily could, could not put you on the spot, but, you know, you've been to the public meetings. We've talked about some of the data. I think we'll dive into that deeper and we want to. Communicate that to the public. That's what we've been talking about how we go about best communicating that to the public because the public does not, by and large, understand how much parking we have, how much more parking we have. The parking garage, Thursday afternoon, noon, Friday at noon, the busiest it ever is during the week, other than a big amount of like, 
it's 55% occupied right around there. With students in town or with baseball, doesn't matter. That means there are hundreds of spaces not occupied. Obviously, reducing it to 240 is going to have an impact, and it's going to be closer to full at those times, but there are still uh, well underutilized lots, Wall, Wall Street, lots out a lot. I have to go down a rabbit hole, but you go there at 6 a.m., you're going to see 20 to 30 cars parked there, and those are residents that are parking there because they can overnight, and, and, they, and they stay there during the day, you know, because it's not strictly enforced and they're not paying. Uh, but if you have a, a parking system set up, you have parking permits and you allow them or, or require them with their monthly permit for residents commuters to park in the garage, in the east lot somewhere that's not the uh, prime location for, for shopping and dining and that sort of thing. It frees up those lots. So then it's, it's the thing you hear from people who say there's no parking downtown is because the best spots are taken up typically by residents or people who are parking in the east and our commuters and are there for hours at a time. And if we can manage that better, so those best spots turn over more, um, I think that will help us get that. So, but you know, to answer your question, yeah, we can look at what the cost would be. I just don't think, you know, like we presented with Wendell, it's just not going to be a financially uh, attractive option for the city. And Greg, I mean, I just drove downtown yesterday to get lunch at noon. Parked on the third level because that was closest to the walkway. I mean, I can count the number of cars that were out there on both hands. I mean, it was it was empty. Um, and, and something else, I've, I've had these discussions with my wife uh, about the garage, and I said, "Well, what would you rather park in? Would you rather be looking for a spot in a very full garage, two level garage, or would you want to be parking in a three story garage that's empty most of the time?" And she says, I'd rather park in the full garage or near full garage because she's going to get safer. Mm -hmm. So that's another aspect that we haven't even talked about. So, but parking is perception also. So, any additional business or council discussion? Um, correspondence, do we have? Yeah. All right. Um, we actually do have a meeting in the second session. Point on um, yeah, it should be brief, but discussing a collective bargaining agreement negotiations. Yeah, so second, thank you. 